man at the garden party could belong to any profession, but he definitely has a professional look. It's partly the preppy casuals he's wearing that create this impression. However, there's also something about his body language, his haircut and complexion, even the trim of his fingernails, or maybe the well-bred neatness of his hands, that express small codes about his class. In any case, Torvald thinks he knows what to expect when the two of them end up in a conversation that is half analytical and half time-killing, and the kind of discussion that constitutes so much social intercourse at bourgeois parties everywhere. It turns out the man is a dentist. This piques Torvald's interest. How do you feel about amalgam fillings, he asks. The dentist is in his mid-thirties, only a year or two older than Torvald, and because of this, Torvald presumes that the dentist will be open to skepticism about the filling status quo. In what sense, the dentist asks. Well, in terms of a possible link to nerve damage. The dentist adopts the pose of a perfectly humanoid robot. Mercury amalgam fillings are utterly safe. There's no proven link between them and any health problem. Proven, Held Torvald says. Does that mean that therefore something doesn't exist? But almost at the same moment, the dentist is asking, what other standard would you use? And Torvald realizes he's taken the wrong tack. Torvald says phlegmatically, the toxicity of mercury has been well established. People are milling around on the lawn. The August sun is setting. Sunlight shines through the dark green leaves of the grapevines like natural laser beams. Torvald quickly glances at the other people in the garden. Some of them are friends of his uncle and aunt, but most are acquaintances of his cousin. What is it exactly you're concerned about, the dentist asks after a pause. Torvald can virtually hear the syllables of the sentence being turned into little chess pieces Objects being quietly moved with a tactical goal in mind. Well, MS above all, but other nerve disorders also. The dentist, the dentist says, if amalgam fillings are such a problem, then how come so many people are walking around with them and are fine? Well, that's not exactly scientific, is it? How do you know they're in such great shape? Have you studied the epidemiology of, the, you know, these diseases? The dentist looks stung. He eyes the food the table is kept on and begins to change his posture as he readies to extricate himself from this particular conversation. Torvald is tempted to become more aggressive, to launch into his It shouldn't be called the Canadian Dental Association, it should be called the Criminal Dental Association tirade, when the dentist looks at him with a new expression. It's true that it's been proven that fillings emit vapors. But the amount of mercury that's absorbed from them is very small. Do you eat fish? Yeah, I love fish. How about tuna? Torvald hesitates, tabulating his recent seafood consumption. I don't eat so much of it. Well, tuna's loaded mer with mercury. If you're concerned about mercury consumption, then uh, keep in mind that you're probably getting more of it from your environment than from your fillings. Torvald says in a tired voice, I've heard that argument before. Doctors use it with x-rays. The sun gives you more radiation, blah, 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 blah. I don't buy it. A lot of these toxins and environmental stresses, they're cumulative. The less you consume of them, the better. Well, there's some truth to that. But what else are you going to do? Amalgam is a beautifully durable material. I never said it wasn't. So, what have you got in your mouth? Mercury. So, you've got amalgams. Do you know what the other options are? Sure, they're resins, gold. The dentist adopts a tone of chummy cynicism. Resins are crap. They're the rust bucket of filling material. You know that, don't you? Yeah, not only that, but they've been implicated as a cause of Parkinson's, I think. That's right. Any material you put in your mouth is constantly being absorbed into your system. Torvald looks at the dentist with a repressed, aghast expression. Great. The dentist realizes what he said. Look, there was one material that they were thinking of bringing on the market a few years ago. It was very tough, and it was cheap. But it was shown there was a linkage with cancer in just a few cases, and so they suspended use of it. They really do care about the toxicity of materials. And if they've allowed amalgam for all this time, that must mean it's basically okay. The conversation has moved from chess to badminton. 
then why not say the exact opposite? Why not argue that the CBA is so terrified of all the amalgam they've shoveled into people's mouths for all these years that they're petrified of the lawsuits they'd be faced with if there is even a peep of an admission of a link to nerve disease? What is it you're worried about exactly? Are you having fillings put in? I had them put in a long time ago, then I had them replaced, then I had them replaced again by those maniacs down at the U of T Faculty of Dentistry. Why do you call them maniacs? Fuck, they're like the red guard of cavities. They've got all these cadres of young dental students who are super nice and want nothing more than to use your mouth for target practice. I'm sure they're not that bad. They are. They... Torvald feels himself getting emotional. It was a number of years before. Torvald ha felt very proud of himself because he'd read a story in the Toronto Star about the inexpensiveness of the clinic. So he got himself put on their waiting list and then went down for a frugal visit. They x-rayed him and cleaned his teeth. When it was time for his third visit, he was running a few minutes late. He rushed up University Avenue towards Elm, the street the faculty was located on. He was surrounded by glassy high-rises. There was a big blue new building on the corner that looked like an elongated motorcyclist's helmet. When he got to the Faculty of Dentistry, he was already out of breath. He was directed by a curt secretary to the second floor while he was, where he was greeted by a punctilious nurse. He was led, almost jogging, into an immense room where all the dental chairs were set up in rows. The room was the size of an aircraft hangar. Torvald was shown to a chair in one of these rows and then left there, waiting and perspiring after all his rushing. A young, chubby male with short, dark hair approached him. Mr. Leasing? he asked. Aye, Torvald twisted his head and smiled. You're here for a checkup? Yeah. My name is Neil. Neil placed Torvald's x-rays on a small light board next to the dental instruments. According to your chart, your feelings are very old. They're cracked. Torvald was still lulled by the big, clean ambience of the room. Uh, he muttered. They should be replaced. Torvald started to become more alert. I don't think they're that old. I just had them put in in the late 90s. Well, it's 2006 now. That's seven, eight years. That's a long time. The thought that if his fillings needed replacing at this rate, he'd need an entirely new set of teeth by the time he was 40 flitted through Torvald's mind. But this idea was anathetized. He felt that something was wrong with what was being proposed, but he couldn't quite muster a protestation. After a moment, he said, Listen, I've been thinking of getting something besides mercury amalgam fillings put in. What? Neil said. You want a resin? I guess. Is that the only other choice? Neil pointed his large arm towards a patient a few dental chairs away. See that woman there? She had resins in her mouth. Now they're all rotten. They say resins are a dentist's best friend because after a year you need a root canal. Yeah, but I'm not that crazy about having more mercury pumped into my system. Mercury amalgam is perfectly safe. Look at me. Neil opened his mouth. It seemed to be plastered with a dark tin-colored silver. He had so many fillings that his teeth looked like pewter deposits. Neil smiled at Torvald triumphantly. What Torvald really wanted was to have gold put into his mouth, but he didn't think that men the mentioning of this was a possibility. He knew it'd be a scandalous suggestion. The whole point of coming to the clinic was to get dental care that a person on a fixed income otherwise wouldn't be able to afford. A benign-looking supervisor passed by Torvald and Neil with his hands clasped behind his back. He was an energetic man in his sixties with a very lined face and a white beard. How's everything, he asked. We are just talking about the advantages of amalgam fillings, Neil said. 
The supervisor, who already appeared so bemused that it was as if his state of mind triggered a very pleasant heat in his body, looked even more warmed up. He regarded Torvald. I'm concerned about Mercury, Torvald said. Why? the supervisor asked. His voice was craggy, charismatic, bullying. Well, because of the toxicity risk and the link to nerve problems. There are millions of people in this city alone with amalgam fillings. Do you see them with nerve problems? It was the first time Torvald had heard this argument, and he didn't know how to respond to it. He lay back in, it, in the chair. Its slippery vinyl seemed to be emitting hypnotic rays. Neil hovered over Torvald, smiling generously, eager to get started. <laughs> There's been no established link between amalgam fillings and health problems of any sort, the supervisor said, quoting scripture, and he walked away. Torvald did some quick mental calculations. If he could get new fillings put in cheaply and then wait another eight years, by that point he would possibly be able to afford gold or whatever else the durable non-amalgam alternatives were. It seemed an acceptable level of risk. Can we start, Neil asked. Torvald nodded. Torvald was in the habit of keeping a full glass of water by his bed and drinking from it with parched thirst when he woke up in the mornings. The day after his dental appointment, he woke up and tasted a metallic awfulness in his mouth. Instinctively, he reached for his glass and took a swig of water. He could taste the whatever it is in his mouth mixing with the water, and he held it in his cheeks like a vile wine. He was groggy. He swallowed his morning water and then, as he got up, realized he'd made a mistake. He should have spat the water out, even back into the glass. But there was no point in crying over spilt or metal-filtered milk, he decided, and he forgot about it. Eight months later, he was phoned up by the clinic and informed that according to his x-rays, he had to come in for some work. He went down and was installed in a chair and had a device placed in his mouth that was an adjustable silver band. This was fitted around his tooth and then tightened. The student assigned to him, not Neil, this time it was a girl named Ginny, began struggling with the band. It's not quite on right, she said. Somewhere in the numb region of his gums, Torvald could feel Ginny wrenching the band back and forth. Your teeth are too tight together, she chastised. Finally, she started drilling, but when she was finished, the band was hard to extract, more wrestling. By the time Torvald was released from his chair, he was sweating, and so much time had passed that he was almost dizzy with hunger. He left the faculty of dentistry and made a beeline toward a food court on Young Street. There he sat down and started eating a large meal of oil and soy sauce-laden chop suey. He tried to eat on the other side of his mouth, the non-drilled one, but the slippery food kept washing through his entire mouth, hotly picking up traces of the still unset amalgam. Torvald had a vague memory of a dentist telling him when he was a kid that a person shouldn't eat for four hours after a drilling. But, because he'd never heard this admonishment from any of the students or staff at the faculty, he figured that somehow this rule didn't now apply. The amalgam was like an agricultural pesticide, only harmful after you've been told it is. Torvald finished his food greedily. A couple of years later, he started to notice small tremors. They began in his face, or maybe it was his arms. He couldn't remember exactly. But one day he got home and was putting his key in the front door when he realized he couldn't do it. Like a victim of some sort of palsy, he twisted his torso to one side, he moved his lower jaw until it was in retarded juxtaposition to his face. He cramped his hand until it looked like a crippled ballerina's. He panicked. The key just wouldn't go in. This attack of failed eye-hand motor coordination passed, and he gained entry to his house. But now fear started to creep up on him. It started to harden. 
He talked to his mom about it. His mother had a series of chronic health ailments. She was very non-judgmental about other people's complaints and also had a large supply of health food and holistic medicine books. I think it's some NSE thing, Torvald said. Look at what Adele Davis says. He picked up the book. It was an age-fattened paperback. It looked too old to be alternative medicine up to date. It says I shouldn't take lecithin. That's got a lot of phosphorus in it. You should take calcium with it. I drink milk. No, you shouldn't drink milk. It's bad for you. Dope. Well, what am I supposed to do? Take tablets, but without vitamin D. You shouldn't overload on vitamin D. And where am I supposed to get these vitamin D free calcium pills from? A health food store? Yes. But I don't want to spend money at those friggin' places. They're too expensive. Honey, if you want to take care of this, you're going to have to try something new. Torvald went to see a doctor. What's the problem, the doctor asked. It's something with my nerves. I have this perpetual twitch just under my eye, and my hands feel funny. Sometimes my legs feel weird. What do you think it is? Well, I'm worried about MS. The doctor looked at Torvald with a poker face. We'll do some blood tests. What's your diet like? Are you eating well? Torvald laughed self-consciously. I guess. I cook for myself. I tend to eat a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Hmm, the doctor frowned skeptically. It's crucial to get sufficient protein. Are you drinking milk? Nowadays, the nerve problems don't increase, but they don't disappear either. Sometimes when Torvald is walking, he'll feel as if his legs might collapse under him. This never happens, but he experiences himself as a kind of hovercraft floating on a buffer of air. One day, he's in a bookstore. He's looking at a table of contents in a science magazine. A finger bonily pokes him in the shoulder. Hey, a voice says. Remember me? Torvald turns around. A man with soft brown hair, tortoise shell glasses, and the look of a junior archaeologist is smiling at him. Uh, hi, hi, Torvald says uncertainly. We met at a party once. You were concerned about your filling. Torvald looks at the dentist. As the dentist smiles, Torvald can see a flash of gold in his mouth. Torvald opens his mouth to speak. He knows what he is going to do is complain, and more to the point, he is going to complain in a manner that is light-hearted, ineffectual. Torvald thinks of getting angry at the dentist, causing a scene by screaming a recrimination at the dentist's whole profession, yelling, I'm being destroyed! There's something wrong with my body, and it feels like poison! Instead, though, Torvald prepares to be polite and sell himself out slightly. As he does, small molecules of self-pity redden the tragedy centers of his brain, while other molecules the color of dun silver float through his bloodstream and make his highly strung nerves even jerkier. <laughs>